All right, folks. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening, wherever you are. Hello, welcome back. This is the fifth installment, Gabe. I think we're on five now, five or six. Oh, yeah, it's a good five. run. We're halfway. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, just, it's been great. We've had a lot of great discussions. Uh, today is going to be a great panel. Uh, we are talking about security awareness training. Um, I'm Brian Hoagley with Side Channel. I will be your host moderating us through this discussion. Today, uh, joining me uh, from Wiser, Gabrielle, uh, we have Naja, Dutch, and Ryan. Uh, just briefly introduce yourselves and we'll get into our topic. Gabe or Gabby? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm Gabby. I'm uh, the CEO and founder of uh, Wiser. Uh, we do security awareness training and uh, we host this webinars, you know, we're about giving back to the community and, and I'm learning in this progress. So, you know, out of those five webinars that I had to summarize, it's a great learning experience, I can tell you. They've been a lot of fun. Yes. And thanks. And thanks for putting this on and, uh, and uh, making this, making this thing happen. This is, this has been a, I think this has been really great for back to basic stuff as we, uh, as we tackle it. Nadja, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Brian and Gabriel, for having me. So my name is Nadia Alfatasi. I'm the founder of Thrive with EQ, Emotional Intelligence. I focus on helping people build human resilience fit for the digital age. I come from NATO almost 20 years, so I'm still well conserved after NATO. I started my own consultancy and I really leveraged the crisis management security. And, and we went through several digital transformations already there and apply it with the work I do with my clients. Excellent, welcome. Ryan, we'll go to you next, welcome. Thank you, uh, Ryan Clotier, president of Security Studio. Uh, we provide a risk management solution that simplifies the risk into business context. So we take all the complexity and tech speak out of it uh, very technical on the back end, but at the end of the day, we need to communicate to our non-technical people something that they can take action on, and, and we do that better than anybody. Nice. Welcome, Ryan. Last and not least, Dutch Schwartz, <laughs> my partner in crime in the InfoSec Rat Pack. Uh, welcome, Dutch. Hey, thanks. I appreciate it. I'm a uh, cloud security strategist. So what that means is I spend my days and nights with uh, CISOs pr predominantly, so people like Brian. And uh, I guess to summarize, we, we all talk about people, process, and technology, all true. Those are building blocks. What I focus on is how do I unlock those, right? So that's really strategy, leadership, and culture. Those are the things that unlock people, process, and technology. Very true. All the fun things. So a little housekeeping for everybody. Actually, it's only one point. There is a questions component in a uh, GoToMeeting. So please hit us up with questions. I will read those, integrate those in as we are talking about uh, this topic. But obviously let's go to the first topic and I'm not gonna go to Gabby first because this is you know kind of his bread and butter. I'm actually gonna go to Ryan. Um, I'm gonna start with you, uh, totally out of order and no points will be awarded. This will be just like whose line is it anyway. Um, Ryan, just ba baseline. How effective is security awareness training today? Uh, current awareness training, I believe to be mostly ineffective. I think, uh, I think we've missed a, missed a mark. We, we talk tech terms, we train them on the language of InfoSec uh, without taking time to understand that that is not their native tongue. Engineering only sounds good to engineers. Um, I, I definitely think we we have a lot of opportunity to change the way we engage to get the results we're after. Too much tech. Dutch, what are your thoughts? Where are we? Uh, where is it effective or ineffective? Well, well, where it's effective is when you do interesting, engaging, micro learning, play games, right? In the same way that we teach our kids, right? That's where it's effective, right? Where it's not effective is this, the polar opposite, which Ryan was kind of alluding to, which is once a year, once a quarter, we have to do insert mandatory training. And, and by the way, there's others besides security awareness, right? Legal, compliance, et cetera. And so if I'm a typical employee, why? I mean, I get it. I like I have to, right? But 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 why, right? And so we know that if you can engage people, they're more likely to uh, internalize that and then make a change for the positive, right? There's a great study on washing hands for nurses, and they know that, of course, they hit, you have to do that, right? And they did three different signs, right? Please wash your hands, um, equip a clever, like, you know, a little saying, and then a, we know you know this, but please, you need to do this for the others, 
and they and they filmed them right anonymously and the last one had the most impact right so you have to find a way to connect with people to to ryan's point and so talking how we talk that's not going to connect with anybody in the same way conversely that if somebody in finance was talking to us about sarbanes oxley like we'd be like oh my gosh why are we talking about this you know get me out of this room right and i say that tongue-in-cheek for my cfo friends but we have to connect with people if they if you don't connect with them then it's just like i have to do this mandatory training yeah okay glad they're paying me for this hour you know yeah. it's not effective so Gabby, you, I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna go to you. I'm gonna allow Nadja to have the, the, the last say on this one. But like you've, you know, you've built a security training platform. You, you built it for a reason because you saw a need. You know, mm -hmm. without going too much into wiser, like what was, what was the driving force as to like why there must have been some ineffective, you know, training and whatnot in the industry that you're like this needs to be solved. There's got to be a better way, right? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I started. So before wiser, there's short background i'll keep it short i founded another company called observe it that i sold to Proofpoint. we dealt with the insider threat uh space and i was preaching to companies all day long about security and all of that and after i exited the company i had some time you know to spend with my uh friends and family and i was talking with my kids more about security and i figured out that you know i was for years talking to companies but when it comes to my kids and my family they were reusing passwords you know not using multi-factor authentication and even school was making it worse because they mandated the kids not to change the password they handed the passwords to my kids at the age of like third grade and i was like damn you know like we are we are like setting our future generation for failure so we have to do something and I realized that the existing security awareness solutions are, are focusing on a company, not on a person level, because all the training was about how can we protect our company? And for me, it was like, we need to, we need to change this. We need to focus on people. And therefore, I started to create videos that had examples or what we call use cases in business, but our personal use cases, like how my personal bank account was hacked or how my kid was hacked. And you will see that you know the type of attacks are very very similar you know the social engineering works you know you can get hacked on roblox and you can get hacked you know with just plain social engineering identity impersonation all of those things so we need to create and this goes back to what ryan says um we need to create engaging content that people can relate to so that's sort of like the um, the short story, and I can go on for hours, but you know we'll we'll give uh, we'll give others uh, you know the opportunity to talk. But I have a lot to say about this. Oh, I know, uh, Naja. What I, I'm curious, like coming out of NATO, I'm curious, like did like did you see these same things happening kind of in that space, like larger organization, right? And then now with what you're doing, you know where where is this working and not working? Actually, I, I like to build up on Gabriel's point, you know, focus both on organizational resilience, technical resilience, but the problem is human resilience, right? And especially now, because we live, you know, people are under a lot of pressure and there are a lot of demands. So getting them, how do you help them generate new cyber hygiene habits, new security habits, right? How do you get them to secure their user environment and not only the product? And um, when I did this, uh, uh, saw this for one of my clients, a training on phishing, which is very information push. Think before you click. The problem is that our brain, its primary job is not designed to think, but to survive. Meaning that if we feel under pressure, if we have stress, our body energy deficit is low. So people are not gonna think from their prefrontal cortex, meaning from reason. They're gonna function from stress mode. And the stressor is exactly the same whether you're going to be chased by a predator, a non-domesticated predator, hit by a car, or email from the boss, or the social engineering scammers, the criminals are using language and they're using tactics to increase pressure, to increase fear, to use all these inputs. So at NATO, we were actually very good in integrating a holistic approach because we had soldiers and civilians on the field, right? This is why we adopted cyber as an operational domain a, year, a few years ago already. For us, cyber uh, de lives depended on it. 
So we had we had several work strands and the behavioral aspect, this is why emotional intelligence comes into play because emotions drive behaviors. Every single human being has feelings and emotions. There's a lot of there's a lot of myths saying women are emotional, right? Or, but that's that's actually very incorrect. It's a science, it's a school of thought. So it's really important to understand in, across people, processes and technology, how do we get people to develop that resilience right, in the workplace so they are more focused, so they are not thrown off their center when they get a smishing a, a text, right, to pay their taxes, when they uh, fall for a CEO fraud, for example, to transfer funds where they don't allow their, you know, we spoke about self-awareness, where they really understand, I had five consecutive bad nights of sleep. I don't have enough glucose, for example. My body is reacting. It doesn't mean something is wrong with me. It means that I have to be just more uh, careful on how I interact, right? So, uh, right. and why human, this is why it's so important to integrate that human aspect. I want to add one more thing, Brian, before, uh, if that's okay? Yeah, no, we're not moving on. I wanted to like pull together like everything I heard. This is great. No, please, Gabby, please, go ahead. One, one problem that, you know, going back to like why it's not effective uh, with a lot of solutions today is that because we security awareness guys um, have the opportunity to force everyone to watch our training, we assume we're basically making our life easier, but in fact, we're not working hard on actually capturing people's attention. You know, if you're in marketing, you need to sell your product to the people. You need to actually capture their attention. It's, it's hard work. That's why, you know, you do A-B testing, a lot of things. But the fact that we're telling people, look, you have to watch it and therefore I'm done my job, people can watch and zoom out totally. So the fact that you send something out and you have a 100%, you know, uh, watch rate doesn't mean anything. Like you have to work harder. Don't, you know, yeah. don't make it easy for yourself. That's very, very true. Ryan. So uh, I actually give a presentation quite frequently. I gave it yesterday to a bunch of HR people and small business owners. And it's called digital life skills, not just an IT problem. Uh, I work very hard to break down the barrier. You know, uh, I take them through the digital birds and bees. Gather around the fire, kids. Dad's got to teach you. And, and, it, and it's about making it that dinner table issue. That's why, you know, previously I said, take the tech talk out of it. Yep. I have a, a friend of mine that is the epitome of, of the failures of security awareness training. 20, 30 years in the game, most clicks ever. And finally I said, what's going on? I said, what happens when you click a link? Well, I get malware, malware goes to the server. I said, okay, what does that mean? I have no idea. I said, now what if I said, when you click the link, you've held the door open, invited the criminal into the living room and then left your house. Oh my God, that's what's happening. I can impact the company like that. My actions can have that level of impact. Whoa, A, now I know I don't want to do it. And B, why the hell after 20 years of sitting through these God awful trainings, this is the first time I've heard it explained to me in human speak. So I think one of our biggest barriers, and this and this goes to, to Nadia's point uh, and Dutch and, and Gabe and, and all of us really, you have to connect with your human as a human. You're something other than a job role. You're something other than a user. You know, we're the only industry in the world outside of drug dealers that refer to our consumers as users, right? So we, we, <laughs> we don't take time. You know, we try too much. And, and, and as an, uh, a security guy, right, um, we try to be smart. We try to be right. We use these big fancy words and, and, and we expect you to get to our level but we don't take time to understand what motivates you. What risk is, is a human function. We're all natural risk managers in the analog world. When we get into the digital world, we don't have the same cues that we do in the, in the which is part of why the, the stress response is so effective because there's no other corresponding cues to help us properly evaluate that in context. And that's where I see the humans failing every day. It isn't that they don't know about multi-factor. It isn't that they don't know about phishing or clicking the links, it's that they cannot contextualize it to something that makes sense when they're sitting at their dinner table. Yeah. Right. There's really the results. Not down, sorry, Brian. One no, last no. sentence. I, I see a lot of talking down to people, exactly mm -hmm. what Brian said, 
talking to people, right? Meet them in their map of the world. There is a, a step, when we talk about C-suite, they say, well, C-suite doesn't understand, they're not investing, right? They're very, very intelligent human beings, right? But you have to talk to people in their map of the world in terms of business disruption, in terms of uh, customer service disruption, and, and really link the security, not as an afterthought, but as an enabler. It's kind of the world's nervous system. Something breaks, your whole business will break. There are a lot of really great ideas here. I wanna kind of tie into them. So I, I've, I was a CISO, I, I had the awesome um, job of having to run a, having to, it makes it sound bad, but um, of running a cybersecurity training program inside of obviously a, a larger one. And like all of these things are all the reasons that, you know, it never took off or never, or like initially never worked, right? So you're talking tech, right? You're talking, you're talking the wrong language. You're talking in the wrong tone. You're not connecting with people. You're talking about something that's not relevant. Um, there's like, out of all of this, there is a lack of connection between what you are trying to say and who your audience is. And that seems to be, I think, the biggest, biggest failure in, in what we do around training. So hopefully out of this conversation, we can figure out what organizations can be doing to do that. Um, we're, I'm grateful that Gabby is here and the technology to, to be able to enable that. But I think it actually goes beyond what technology you use and select to, to enable. It's how do you actually structure a program to get people to understand it? Most of the time, let's just, let's just level set. Most of the time we're dealing with adults, right? In our organizations, maybe some of them act like children, that's a different discussion. But for the most part, we are, we are, we are you know, working with adults. We need to think about security training, not as a checkbox kind of thing, but adult learning, right? The, the reason that we as children, I, you know, I understand watching my 12 year old learn is because the teacher has a captive audience and that is their job to, that is their job at that time is to learn, right? And the teacher teaches in a way that gets the child to learn. Somehow we think that as adults, if we just put information in front of people, they'll get it and we can move on. And that seems to have been kind of the trend and it's obviously not working. So there's a lack of connection. There's a lack of knowing your audience, being too technical. Uh, Ryan, I love that. That's that's a great example that you you point out on like, <laughs> oh, that's what it does? Like, it, like, like pulling the curtain back and be like, this is what you're doing, like explaining it that way. Again, there was no connection there. So um, the integration into personal life piece, I, I, I hope I hear more about this. I think that's huge. I taught, people older I, I specifically taught the older people in the organization I was at this way um because they were like they didn't understand how MFA why MFA was important and it was like the thing that you're doing for your bank that thing that you're doing for your bank that your bank is requiring for you that's protecting your money I need you to think about doing that here at this company in the same way you want to protect your money at the bank like you want to you should be thinking about how to protect this organization that connection, that bringing it into the personal life was like the aha. That was like one of the greatest things I saw. I was like, oh, this, that's how you do it. Um, so let's let's go into um, let's go into like a, how do you train them? Like you, you 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 we can pick great technology, we can pick great content, but what are our thoughts around building the program or or something? You gotta set in motion the foundation to go, we're gonna have a training program. How do we do it? Uh, Dutch, let's start with you. Yeah, so first of all, it has to be signaled from uh, informal group leaders and formal management that it's important, right, and why it's important, right? And you do that through culture, right? So culture can be thought of as values, attitudes, and beliefs, right? So values that can impact, I can understand, you know, not just values or, or, or Ryan's values, but, but beliefs that we can interact with those, right? And I can understand those, and I can say that, you know, Here's, here's how we're thinking about this differently. We need to build it as part of your culture, right? It can't be abstract, it can't be separate from what we do daily, weekly, monthly. It has to be part of our culture that this is how we go to, you know, how, how we go to work, right? And the analogy sometimes that I use is it's like quality, right? If we dial back to the 1900s, quality was individual workmanship. So Gabby was good at XYZ thing, that's why we go to Gabby, right? And we sort of lost that when we went to corporations and production, we lost that concept. And then we had to relearn well, what's quality mean, right? And so now you use, we say the things about quality 
regardless of which part of the business you're in, you understand that quality is intrinsically important, right? Because we've jumped the chasm. We're still back behind the chasm as it relates to security, right? People don't understand intrinsically why it's important. And in the same way that we don't have secretaries anymore because everybody learned, right, how to type and everybody had learned how to use basic office things, right? Um, that's where we have to get to, where everybody just has a fluency in security and they understand why it's important. So it has to be signaled though by leadership and by informal group leaders that it's important so that people then internalize that as you then present different ways of doing the training. So that would be my piece of it. So I would say, think about your culture and how you wanna make that interesting and important to your employees. I just lost my screen. Technology fails. I love the culture piece. Um, the question is gonna be like, how do you, I mean, you can't just be like, this is gonna be part of our culture. Like, how do you start the inroads, right? Like. Well, it's, like, it's, what, it's the same way that you would do the same way that you as a CISO would do it for anything, Brian, right? I mean, so you need to sit down with your peers, right? And the right. business to say, listen, you know, thank you. I'm elbowed my way to the table. Yay, I'm at the adult table. Okay, cool. So how do you, right? How do we make security to now just point? It's it's part of what almost every entity does anymore, right? The digital transformation is so critical. So you, you have to engage with your, your peers. Go ahead, Nadja. Yeah. yeah. I was just following Brian's instruction to me. No, thank you. Makes this all a lot easier. <laughs> I actually wanted to build on what you said, Dutch. I, many organizations treat this as a adaptive change program, right? Reactive. Okay, what can we do to react? So in, instantly they think training uh, immediately, but uh, it should be um, approached as a transforma transformation change program. So what I worked a lot in, in NATO and is using stakeholder engagement and communication plan. You really need to take back perspective and understand how are you going to ingrain security within your organization, right? What works, what doesn't work? Who are your internal stakeholders? Who are your external stakeholders, which is crucial because of the regulatory landscape. There are being laws that are, are being passed that will hold uh, C-suite direct liable on certain issues or reporting ransom. This has huge or cyber incidents on critical infrastructure services. So these all have huge implications. And fear arises when there is a lack of knowledge, right? Because it seems like it's another additional mountain that we don't necessarily have the time to climb because we have other mountains that we are climbing currently. And I think really investing in a change program um, transformative way and having a solid stakeholder engagement and communication plan, understanding what types of training, you using technology that is immersive, that is experimental, that really matches the emotional talent intensity with the belief intensity to make that connection. Why do people change their behavior when they feel it? Right? You need to you need to engage people out of their comfort zone. And top leadership is very important. I've seen many times within like NATO, but also in clients, that when top leadership, someone does not demonstrate those security behaviors, why would John Doe somewhere else do the same? Right? So I really think it's, there are several moving parts which are not one size fits all approach, but treating it as a change program, a transformative one, and uh, will pay off in the long run. Ryan, what's what's been your approach in in kind of seeing security, you know, program, you know, implemented along this kind of culture top down approach? You know, is it? So so I actually take a, a wildly different approach. Um, okay. Because I work a lot with K twelve, and I do this on purpose. Uh, K twelve, I I believe is is the hardest uh, industry in the world to bring security to. You are fighting every barrier imaginable. Okay. Uh, and I do that because I, if I can solve it for them, I generally can solve it for everybody. So I take a multifaceted approach. I absolutely agree with what Dutch said about culture and what Nadia said about, about you know, really, uh, you know, using those EQ elements and integrating it. What I like to do is, is take a reward-based approach for starters. I create a competitive, positive experience. I, you know, folks will fight tooth and nail over a candy bar. I've never seen more six-figure salary folks fight it out over a king size candy bar, but they will. So I create incentives. I look at, can I approach this from different learning styles? Can I bring a physical component to this? It, it, you know, maybe you're a kinetic learner and no matter how many times I take you through a slide deck, no matter how many times I gamify you, 
if that's not your learning method, you're not building that neurological association. So I take different, and, and then I look at the mental models, right? What are the mental models that, that are most common in, in you as a person that it really is going to trigger and relate? So I kind of take a, a, an approach that says there is no one size fits all. Now I can't do individual and in scale, but what I can do is take some cultural elements, build a supportive reward-based program instead of a punitive program. Uh, and, and then when I deliver it, I try to deliver it in several different ways. So video based, gamified, kinetic, you know, and the other thing I try to do is I encourage uh, leaders of, of, of school districts, of, of private businesses, tie this back to existing structure. The, when we treat this as an add on or an extra, that sounds like work and I don't understand it. So what I do is I actually use uh, educational learning models. So we teach the kids to look both ways before crossing the street because inherently that's not in us as a human. We have to teach them the stove is hot, right? We're not afraid of fire when, when we're first little humans because we don't know there hasn't been a consequence. So we educate, we, we teach that way. So making it relatable, tying it back to existing structures, existing programs. I tell business leaders all the time, add this to the bullet point of the policies you already have. Add it as a bullet point to the procedures. You have a safety procedure for physical safety. Let's add that cyber component and let me show you how the digital and physical worlds come together to have physical impact. So the more I can tie it back to their personal being and personal self, um, keeping it lighthearted. Humor is very effective. There's a, an awareness company out there that, that made some really funny videos um, most companies didn't go with it because the HR team's like, I don't think we can show that to people, but it was highly effective in getting the average person to have the aha moment. And, you know, so if we look at the common mental models, you know, what is, you know, we think this is common knowledge and it's not right. So mm -hmm. we, we have to abandon some assumptions. Um, quick story. I had a guy that I went through the laundry list. I can hack your bank account. Yep. Don't care. I can turn off your pacemaker. Yep, don't care. I can do all this doom and gloom. Don't care. I said, you know, I can manipulate your fantasy football results. The guy freaks out, looks me, looks me dead in the eye and goes, how many factors can I have? Still didn't know what multi-factor was, but now we wanted all of them. So it's, it's about finding that connect, you know, to connect to our users. So what is our company culture, right? What, what are we about? And, and, and if, I, if that's not enough, what drives you as a human? Is it social causes? Mm -hmm. Is it is it protecting your family? You know, I, I'll ask people all the time. Uh, this is going for business leaders. How do you protect your family from cybercrime? Because if you can't answer me that, don't tell me how you protect the business from it. Right. Let's start yeah. there. So you know, it's a little bit of a different approach, but it really is. You know, we've got to be more flexible. We've got to. You know, Dutch touched on this micro learning. You know, this this once a year stuff doesn't work. Uh, and then get feedback from them. By the way, we don't collect enough feedback. Tell us why this didn't, why this sucked, why you hated it, mm. why it was on the left screen while you were busy updating TikTok on the right screen. What could we have done better? I think we we need to do a better job as an industry of engaging our users and saying, you know what, we're sorry, you're right, that slide deck is awful. How can we better get you to participate? You want a live demonstration? You know, sometimes that's all it takes is walk them through the building and go, okay, see that there? Here's what a bad person could do with that. Oh my gosh, I didn't know. Right. Yeah, there's, well, there's a lot Luckily for of, Brian, TikTok is the same as his real life. So this is his TikTok is. right it's, here. I know all the dances with the... Um, so just real quick, uh, EI, hopefully I'm saying your name right, definitely sees gamification working for what he's doing and, you know, connects with the idea that, you know, different strokes for different folks can't do the same thing for everybody, right? You, you have to make some of the stuff unique. Yeah. Gabby, what do you got? We're, yeah, we'll so I wanna to touch three things. One is, you know, people can see, we talked about TikTok, right? So people are sitting with their phone, consuming content all day long. So it's not like there is a problem to display video to people. They're just not interested in our videos. So we need to learn how to, you know, what we did, for example, in Wiser, we collaborated. So a lot of our content, we have our security guide, but we collaborated with people, you know, content creators from TikTok and Instagram to create unique type of content that is viral in nature because you want people to share. If you want to raise awareness, you want people to share your content. Just watching it is not enough. We measure, did anybody share our content? That's success. That means we're 
spreading awareness. We even connect it to pop culture stuff because it's relevant right now. And that's very unique. You know, these are the things that get people actually to want to watch it. The second thing beyond, you know, creating the content is using stories. That's something that people remember. You know, when you tell stories, people just, it, it connects all the dots. It puts things in context because telling people just look at the link, you know, make sure the address is good enough. That, you know, but why? You know, like in, in the context of things, it makes it much more easier to also remember. The next thing is that security awareness is a two-way communication. You know, you want to motivate people to come to you. It's not just you pushing information. Uh, and you can do that with tools you already have. You know, you don't have to buy a solution for that, like Slack or Teams. You can create a channel. We have that in our company as well, where we motivate people to like share things they saw online. You know, hey, look at this funny thing that I found. Oh, they try to scam me this way. Look at this. Some people laugh at it. Some people comment. But that creates that two-way communication that it's not just us pushing, pushing um, information. And the last thing that, you know, I want to just piggyback on what Ryan said, because the feedback is so important, you know. I think um, you want to have feedback. We do that, you know, every time somebody watches a video or completes a training, uh, we ask them for feedback. And people are actually sending a lot of feedback, you know, like, how can I share it with my, you know, with my kids? Like you want to read or you want to understand what people are experiencing in order to improve. How can you improve if you're not asking people, you know, did this help you? So like moving away from that compliance, you know, just, okay, we're at 100% and just making it more engaging, asking for feedback and, and motivating people to spread the awareness internally. That's hard, but it's possible. Can I just say one last on that if I if I may it's actually really really important because a lot of security training from a compliance perspective if it's command and control fear-based stress rises because people's defense mechanisms they are functioning from the hippocampus part of the brain right limited bandwidth already however when you make it engaging when you connect they are more relaxed they can use system two of the brain which is the critical thing which processes new information and it doesn't feel as a burden. The reason why we have higher levels of stress, stress in itself is not bad, but chronic stress and higher levels of stress, it is unnecessary because of fear-based perception. And I think this is a huge shift that needs to happen within the security. The security, we need to be pragmatic, we need to have the right balance of, of fear and compliance, we should not be nonchalant about it because it is serious uh, in in the sense but we should also understand that uh, using fear for compliance is no longer working how many media headlines do we see of ransomware attacks every day how many statistics people are are zooming out they are more interested in TikTok videos, and I'm still wondering how people make all these dance moves without, you know, hurting themselves. <laughs> it's another security issue, but uh, I think it really requires rethinking security on how we communicate and how we make it relevant in people's map of the world. So I love what Ryan said about that, thinking that we have different mental models, we have different ways of learning and retaining information, and that we have a lot of brain fog going on with all the information <laughs> and just one word to add to that fatigue yeah have to address the fatigue people are worn out yeah so, but, so uh, can, can i make oh, an good, observation good, yeah i want to make an observation to pull three you know together what you all, you all just said the sheer fact that we call this awareness is a problem yeah. this space that we call it awareness is an issue and i would i would suggest that we consider changing the way that we talk about this because awareness doesn't really mean anything right belief precedes action we're trying to get to action now there's ways of thinking about action right transformation like Nadja just said right so you can think about habits which ryan kind of alluded to right so you can look at george finney's book right uh, on the habits right so we want to in incur a change right so the sheer fact that we put a box around this right when you put a box around there then we we have you know, a mental object, right? That says awareness. Well, okay, thanks. Thanks for making me aware, appreciate it. I'm moving on. Doo, doo, doo. Mm -hmm. It's really not awareness, right? What you're trying to do is do security change that's integrated in the way you do business. 
And so just, I think it's problematic, the fact that we just call it awareness. It shouldn't be just awareness. Awareness is the first step, right? Then you need engagement. Then you need habits to change. And then you need transformation. And then it becomes intrinsically internalized, right? Those are the basic steps. But I think we actually should talk this about this differently. Yeah. Abby, well, I, could, I mean, I I mean this your, yeah, good. Um, so I, I, I have a series called Going From Aware to Care. And it's all about that transition. It, it's how do I, I'm aware of a ton of things every day. I don't give a single flip about. Right. So how do I go from aware to care, right? And, I, and that's exactly what you're talking about. How do we get that transformational change? And, and I do agree that I think awareness, everybody's aware. I haven't met a person yet that isn't aware of this issue. I still struggle to meet people that know what to do, know what actions to take, know who to tell. Um, it, it almost feels like we all need to have an adult. Like, when do I tell an adult, right? When when do I reach out for help? And that's where I see people struggle the most is, is okay, fine, I, you, you, I heard it, I get it, I still don't understand it, so I don't know what to do about it. Let's do actually, actually, um, I'll, I'll say something oh, short. Ahead, it's, <laughs> because this is, this is key. Like, you know, people that drive went through classes and they got their driver license so they are aware of the road signs right they are aware so we can we expect no accidents you know there's still accidents why because we're emotional creatures right we think we'll be able to pass we think things will turn out good for us so it's about habits and routines awareness is not enough and how do you make those habits that work as guardrails for us in our lives so we use them all the time, not only when we think there's risk? And that takes, you know, uh, repetition, and that takes much more than just learning. I think I, I've always worked off of the statistic that it takes somewhere between six to eight months to turn a, a trait into a learned behavior of some sorts, right? So obviously, I think we're all on the same page. Once once a year doesn't work, it, it's figuring out how to engage. Hopefully, when when people leave this you know uh, this webinar today, you know you're going to look at your own program and go, how can I make a better connection with my employees in this organization so I can get them to understand and learn why this is important and should be important and built into like their synapses going forward, like. How do I get everyone from the from the from the team that is doing you know janitorial you know operations to the CEO get them to understand what their role is and maybe the training is different for each of them right maybe the connection to them is different you know it, it probably should be you know you're not training your CEO maybe on the same things that you're training you know the folks in you know other departments I want to actually kind of hit one area that's that I've I've always wrestled with now the CISO seems to always be the one that takes on the one being responsible for security awareness training. I have always felt that <clears throat> seems much more like a human resources or an HR centered function, but somehow we pulled that, pulled it completely out of that LMS, handed it over to the CISO and said, you go figure out how to go do it. While all the rest of the employee training for the organization is gonna live inside of this neat box and structured and well-resourced HR platform. What's everyone's thoughts on where should security awareness training actually fall underneath? Because if it is truly supposed to be part of the culture, why are we pulling it over to be this this silo over on the side and treated separately? Uh, I, round robin, Nadja, go first. No, actually, I, I love this question because I think it is we should apply uh, a matrix uh, perception on this and having like a cross-functional accountability who's accountable and who is coordinating input i'm actually working with one one client with the human resources department but the information security awareness is my sme point of contact right so the design and the implementation is done through human resources but the, the design of the scenarios and the case studies is done with the information security officer to understand the pain points so i think it comes back to shifting paradigms and also shifting our perception and it's not so much about uh, the formal reporting line but how can we make this happen as a team right formally you need to have reporting structures etc but mm -hmm. cross 
teams, you need to have people who, you know, project management basics. You have accountability and you have, you know, those who are holding the risk, etc. But you work together again as people. You also, and this is another element of, of security awareness or um, cyber mitigation, is healthy security cultures have healthy collaboration, communication and coordination. Because when I always say S hits the fan, you do not have time to have ethical discussions or to take things personal, right? When the CEO is yelling or when there's so much pressure. And, and here you need to have people who are in the incident response team and in the crisis management that have high levels of emotional intelligence. If you have someone who has low levels of flexibilities, low levels of stress tolerance, it's going to be a disaster in that boardroom during a ransomware attack, right? And this influences decisions we make. And we saw with the colonial pipeline attack, I don't have any insights, but the decision was made very quickly to cut off supply chains, which had huge implication on customer service disruption and, and caused also now investigations, etc. So the behavioral aspect exercising this, understanding this, right, self-awareness, social intelligence, before reducing the risk, anything that's unfamiliar to the mind causes fear and is a risk. So make it familiar to the mind, right? Fear, the antidote to fear, I always say, is knowledge. Right? Don't be uh, uh, dissuaded by fear. What is fear here telling me? What do I need to know? And become, this is my, my tagline, Become comfortable with being uncomfortable. It's the only way you will survive in this uh, volatile, uncertain complexity and ambiguous environment. Be comfortable with being uncomfortable. And that is a human element, which we need to help people with. Very good. I love that. Dutch, what are, what are, your, what are your thoughts here on who and how is this managed? So let me go back to your question. Why is this happening, right? This happened because we're still the newest domain. Right. Right. And so we've and then we exacerbated it really kind of to Ryan's point and probably got Gabby's to some degree, his aha moment. Right. Where we kept it over here. Look how smart we are now. We do security stuff. And, and there's this superhero complex, I will call it sometimes. Right. Yep. That, that you can you can anyone right could be guilty of. So that's why it happens. So now we've got to break that down. Right. I, I frankly think that when you start as an employee, um, we should do a, a security fluency assessment of you, right? Because that's the stage that we're at right now, right? Again, everybody's aware, to, to Ryan's point, everybody's, everybody's aware that there's that there's impacts to this. So let's assess where you are. And then let's give you a bespoke learning path as you go through your normal embarkation learning, whatever that is in your culture, that should include security training, right? Not just awareness, training, like meaningful, tangible training. And I should say, by the way, I'm gonna give you free tools that you can use in your personal life because now right. all of a sudden I have a, that, that's an impact to me, right? Give them a VPN, give them a password man, give it to them. What the cost is it, as it relates to an entity, a corporation, a business enterprise is nothing, right? It's so right. minimal, just give them to them. Get them engaged from the beginning is where I think we need to be. And to your point, wherever your learning, training systems, program, you know, programs, process, where those live, that's where they should live. And to now just point, it should just be informed by somebody, as 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 impacts change over time, we should be informing that. But the learning should live wherever your learning is inside of your culture. Love that, Gabby. Yeah. So th this reminds me uh, about 12, 14 years ago when I started with Observe it. it. Like I said, it was an insider threat solution, and we just introduced it. It was the same question. So who is dealing with insider threat? So when we started, people said, "Okay, it's an incident. Let's give it to the SOC guys." And we were, you know, like the SOC guys cannot investigate the CFO or anyone else because anybody can be an insider threat. And you see that, you know, at the beginning, they just went to the technical people. But today you have insider threat program managers and, you know, people specialize in that because it's a very delicate uh, thing. You have to consult with legal, you have to consult with HR, you have to consult with security, a lot of investigation tools. And I think this is what's going to happen with security awareness. I think the ROI of having, of looking at this as a role versus this is a product or a project, because that sounds like scope, you know, like, okay, mm -hmm. we're going to run it once or whatever. And who's handling this? This guy. Okay. Let him, you know, let us know when you're done. We need a report. But once this is, becomes a role, 
I think and I and I hope that it will because the ROI of having a person full time understanding security, understanding marketing, you know, a person that can either work with marketing or has a marketing understanding, uh, somebody that can uh, talk to senior management is comfortable with those discussions. I think it's an exciting role. It's, uh, you know, it's a cross departmental uh, role. So hopefully, you know, in the near future, we'll see more and more security uh, awareness program managers because I think it's totally worth it. Yeah, um, I have a great story about that, but I won't go into it. Had one, um, great idea, just didn't seem to like take as well, probably too early. Um, the best one I ever heard of was actually the woman who was at LinkedIn uh, years, years ago. So I totally stole the idea from her. She um, hired a school teacher, a former school teacher who then ran the information security training program. Why? Because that person knows how people learn because they're a teacher. And it was, I, I heard that, I sat in a conference, I heard that, I was like, greatest thing I literally have ever heard on how to tackle this. Get somebody who's actually qualified to teach to actually go teach this stuff and get it out there. So it can be done. It's probably only going to work for larger organizations. So thinking about small organizations, how they tackle it, but you know, that's, it's, you know, it's all resources. Ryan, what are your thoughts around like where this should live? How does this interact with like who this sits with? You know, what, what are your thoughts here? CEO. CEO, CEO on the CEO and board are who are ultimately accountable for the cybersecurity information security of any business and the CISO's job is not to make risk decisions for the business. The CISO's job is to make recommendations to, to highlight right. the risk in context and then implement those decisions to the best of their ability. So I say move that accountability back to the top of the stack because this is a business issue, not a tech issue. This is about company culture. This is about you know these things. And by the way, when the CEO is the one delivering the awareness training, obviously being properly supported by hr and properly supported by you know the various functions and it does help to have a you know teaching component as well but when the ceo is the one that says i'm doing this and now i'm going to show you what i'm doing you change culture instantly you mm -hmm. immediately all of a sudden people go oh it's that serious well yeah. i'm going to do what the see because the ceo is doing it so i'm either doing it because i'm a ladder climber i'm doing it because i don't want to get fired I'm doing it because everybody else is doing it, but it sets a tone that is so significantly different than the way we've done it today. Because the top of the stack said, this is the way we're gonna do these things. Just like they get up and tell us, this is the way that we're gonna approach engaging our customers. And this is the way that we're gonna deal with these things. So having that accountability where it belongs at the mm -hmm. highest level of the business. Now I don't expect the board per se to give a presentation, but I do expect the board to be accountable to ensuring that they're holding the CEO accountable to being an active participant, not just a figurehead, not just, you know, here's one slide with my picture on it and some BS statement right. that we worked with, you know, uh, communications on, but actually demonstrating, maybe even going as far as live setting up MFA on their phone and showing you, look, I push this, I push that. You now create an engaging situation that opens the door for so many of the other great things we talked about. And to Dutch's point, not to not to plug, but it is free. Uh, we actually provide a free personal risk assessment for use at home for your family. And what you get is a credit score. You get a security score that's equal to your credit score, it has the same meaning, right. same numbers, same impact. And what we found is by doing that, we can then give folks the roadmap that says, here's where you are. So we don't ask them about backing up data in the context of business, we say, are the family photos safe? Have you protected yeah. the family photos? Is the, the Xbox save that your child is going to have a meltdown over if something happens to it? Is that is that backed up, right? So, nope. so changing that context, but I, I love the idea, Dutch, and I do think we need to shift to, you know, we, we put people through nightmarish level skills tests before we hire them especially in technical roles. I mean, I'm assuming all of us here have, have gone through some godforsaken, you know, prove that you know JavaScript. Well, what about, and we run background checks and credit reports on people. We make hiring decisions based on their financials in their personal yeah. life. Why would we not use the same measuring stick to evaluate their security acumen 
as either part of the hiring process as a, as a vetting, especially for high risk roles. Also, that helps us meet them where they are. So now I have an objective measure that shows me where you are in, in the spectrum of your security acumen and, and uh, engagement. And now I know where I need to train you. Because if I start somebody that's at the mid tier at the beginning, they disengage because I already know that. And if I try to start somebody at the beginning at the mid tier, they go, I have no idea what this means and they check out. So I think, you know, that is definitely something we need to start moving towards. And the human assessment, if I may ask, as, as well, right? Because, for example, now we live, breathe, work online. So someone who has high levels of emotional expression, they will share a lot of information, even unconsciously. That is a high risk person. And doesn't mean that you cannot hire them, et cetera, because you can all, it's all about what you said, Ryan, and everyone here, is how do you make it engaging, connecting, so people understand the risk in their map of the world. But I, I, I really think that we need to like combine these uh, security acumen from a, uh, uh, when we talk about social engineering, you know, uh, attacks, which are increasingly on the rise, because it's easier to hack human minds than circumvent uh, technology. How can we use this information and then make decisions on identity control, privilege access, who gets in the incident response team, crisis management, who will break on the stress easier, et cetera, et cetera. And make you know, informed decisions and not give someone who has high levels of emotional expression or high uh, low levels of independence who works as a lone wolf, not necessarily sharing information, extreme uh, uh, privilege rights, right? And yeah. so this is like things that you may not consider initially as an organization, but are really critical. This has been an amazing conversation, everybody. Um, a lot to process, and that's now Gabby's job is to summarize all of this into a phenomenal blog post, which you will see. This is going to be this has been recorded. It will be available online as well. So if you wanted to rewatch, review some of the topics and concepts that we're going over, um, I want to be very cognizant of everybody's time. It's almost at the top of the hour. I'm sure we're all running from meeting to meeting, so bio breaks are always appreciated. Um, uh, look, Brian Hoagley, I said very little. I'm so appreciative of the panelists on here today for going over this very important topic. Ryan, Dutch, Nadja, Gabby, thank you so much for being on and taking the time uh, away to be part of this. Um, follow any of these folks online. I know for a fact that they are all on LinkedIn. Um, we will make sure that they are linked. They have some great content. Um, Check out what we're doing with Wiser. Another one of these in two weeks. We've got, I think, three more after that. Definitely take a look at the last couple ones. I mean, the incident response one we did a couple weeks ago was just phenomenal, I thought. Um, and there's been some other really great gems along this whole thing. So again, Brian Hoagley on, on behalf of Side Channel and Wiser, thank you everybody for joining. Be safe, uh, great attentiveness today on all of this. And thanks again, everyone. Be good. And we'll see you next time, all right? Bye. Thanks, everyone. It's been great.